Welcome to an evening with Meryl Blair, a close look at the Presbyterian Women Horizons Bible Study. What my grandmothers taught me from the best guide possible, its own author. Thank you for using PW Bible Studies and thank you for choosing to spend this evening with us. Susan Jackson Dowd, PW's Executive Director, will now introduce our presenters. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Betsy. Um, I have the honor of introducing Meryl, our Bible study author, as well as Magdalena Garcia, who wrote the suggestions for leaders for this study and also translated the study into Spanish. Magdalena does that for us uh, with most of our PW Bible studies. I have the joy of meeting Meryl in Australia. I was invited to speak at the Australian Women's Conference in 2017 and Meryl was there and leading Bible study. And I listened to Meryl talk about um, women and the uh, lineage of Matthew in Matthew. And I thought Christian women needs to hear this story too. So we met and talked and Meryl was agreeable and we were able to, uh, to work with her to write the study that you have before you. For 25 years, Merrill has served as senior lecturer in Old Testament at Stirling Theological College, part of the University of Divinity in Melbourne, Australia. She and her late husband, Graham, also taught during sabbaticals at North Rise University in Northern Zambia. Merrill has represented Churches of Christ in Australia on ecumenical councils at state, national, and international levels. In retirement, she continues to present Bible studies at women's conferences. Merrill is passionate about the power of story to engage and open the imagination. Her long journey with Old Testament story never ceases to surprise and challenge her, and she loves to share this with others. I'll take a minute also to introduce you to Magdalena Garcia. Again, she's with us on this call and Magdalena will open us with prayer after I have introduced her and then lead us uh, back to Merrill to, uh, to talk about the study. Magdalena is pastor of Ravenswood Presbyterian Church in Chicago, Illinois. Formerly, she served as hospice chaplain for Vitus Healthcare. She's a graduate of McCormick Theological Seminary and a recipient of the 2008 Presbyterian Church USA Women of Faith Award. She writes and translates for Presbyterian publications, including Presbyterian Women, and publishes liturgies under her personal blog, justleros.blogspot.com. A native of Cuba, Magdalena has lived in Chicago since 1971. Magdalena is an active Presbyterian woman, woman and we have worked with her across the years, I've had the joy of working with her um on several studies and projects magdalena i will now turn it over to you to open us with prayer thank you susan let us pray god of life we give you thanks for the opportunity to gather on this evening to explore your word through this marvelous bible study God of our ancestors, we give you thanks for our grandmothers, nuestras abuelas, and for all the women who have nurtured us, inspired us, and challenged us. We pray that your spirit may guide us as we seek new ways to live out our faith today. Give us courage, just like you gave to Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, Bathsheba, and Mary, to stand for justice, truth, and mercy, and to do what is right, no matter the risks. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. And I'd like to now just turn the mic over to our main speaker for the evening, my new sister from Australia, and I just met her tonight. Uh, first time I actually see her face sort of live. So I hope that someday I get to meet her in Australia. So please let's give all of our attention to Meryl Blair um, for the rest of the evening. 
Thank you so much, Magdalena. And thank you to all of you uh, for giving your time and time over the last year uh, to these studies, which were a great joy for me to write. And it's been a great joy to uh, live with them for the last, I don't know, three, three years at least. <laughs> I think uh, I've been immersing myself. I've been living with these stories for many, many, many years because I teach uh, biblical narrative uh, among the many other things that I've taught. And uh, I've, I've been captured by these stories, but of course, immersing myself in them while working uh, with different groups and writing the studies and working with Betsy and getting feedback and doing the DVDs and doing blogs. Oh, my goodness, it's just immersed me deeper and deeper and deeper. And uh, I, I'd like to share a little bit of, of what I would think of as maybe a year living with the grandmothers with you. Some of my own um, even deeper understandings since I've, I've spent so much time with them. But first of all, I just want to say a little bit about biblical narrative, about story. I talk a little bit about that uh, in the introduction to um, to the studies, but uh, not a huge amount. I'm just going to share my screen for a moment because it's actually uh, just one of those share screen. Yay, it worked. There we go. Um, it, it's one of those interesting concepts that we're not always as familiar with as we might think, because often uh, our church exposure to Bible is in a, in a very sort of packaged form of one small bit taken out of context on a Sunday morning, uh, maybe a study, series of studies, which are uh, perhaps a little bit more around um, how I feel about this, what it's saying into my life at the moment, all of which are good. You know, there's nothing wrong with any of that. But one of the things I've found most utterly enlightening in my own um, uh, scholarship was discovering the skill of, of the art, as uh, Robert Alter calls it, of biblical narrative, how the ancient Near Eastern storytellers used um, all of their skills to present characters, to present plots, to lead us into, into places of awe and wonder, but also strong engagement and sometimes, you know, very, very strong emotional reactions to things that are horror and, and being appalled by things as well as being enlightened and um, feeling great love for the people in the stories. So I'm not going to say a huge amount of that about that because we'd be here for six months, which is how long it takes me to teach biblical narrative. But I just started off with this uh, picture on my screen, which is... Um, as you can see, a piece of art by a, a man called Philip Ratner, uh, The Binding of Isaac. And he writes, uh, he, he, he drew this um, as his own response to, and I think artists see things that people who don't have that sort of visual um, ability to think about things don't always see. And I love what it tells us about story, about narrative, which is that there are many points of view, that there are many bits and sometimes the focus comes in close and sometimes the focus is further, further away, that there are patterns, there are movements, and we don't see it all at once. Um, and so sometimes we need to sort of come back and come back and come back and we'll see another bit here and another bit there. And at different times of our lives or our experience, we're drawn to different, different bits. But the text itself invites us to see. There's a word, um, it's hine in, in Hebrew, but it was translated in the King James Version, for example, as behold. And it became a kind of behold, you know, it, it sort of broke into the narrative, it annoyed people, uh, they took it out of the more modern versions, but in fact the word means look, look, and it's sort of saying 
<laughs> it takes our focus and it moves it to a new point of view. And when we, whenever we see that, we're supposed to lift up our eyes and see through the eyes of the character something that they hadn't noticed before. And so we notice with them. And so there is something very visual about the very nature of biblical story that invites us to come in and look with the characters and imagine with the characters and, and enter into a world of story, which like any story is a kind of safe place to practice being human, if that makes sense. Um, one of the little things that I also use with my students, the question of what is narrative? What is story? How are stories told? Why are they told? We love stories. I, I, the, the quintessential picture of tell me a story, someone with a whole lot of little kids sitting around their knee, absolutely spellbound, but not just little kids. Now, I think we're all familiar with the phenomenon of people in church listening much more carefully to the children's talk than they do to the sermon, because it's often more about story and um, less about engaging our intellect. And we, we, we really respond to that. And there are stories from all around the world, everybody. This is a cross-cultural phenomenon. This is what humans are built to do, is to tell and listen to stories. And it's always about making sense of what it means to be alive. We have our sacred stories, the ones that we find in the Bible, but then also the ones that we tell ourselves. And there's something beautiful about the telling of how we came to faith, of the everyday and extraordinary ways that we've experienced God in our lives. And you'll have felt that yourselves, I'm sure, when you're talking to a friend and telling them about something amazing and unexpected that happened you tell it in a different way to how you tell how you went down to the shops yesterday. You, you find words and images and you try to invite them into that wonder, that sense of wonder. And this is what the telling of sacred stories does. A wonderful man called Terry Pratchett, who, who's uh, one of my favourite authors, fantasy, UK fantasy author, says that people think that stories are shaped by people and in fact it's the other way around. This is why stories are so important, they shape us. And if you wonder about that, think about the stories that the church told for many, many, many centuries about the place of women and how that contained and controlled and sidelined women until we believed it. There was that sense of, no, of course I can't be a minister. Of course I can't do this. Of course I can't do something else because they were what were told. And the stories of strong women that are actually there in the Bible were not told. They were not preached. They were not part of the storytelling of the church until some people began to say, hang on, <laughs> What about, can we shape our stories differently? And what about if we tell these stories? How might they shape us so that we can have a voice, that we can become the people, the leaders that God wanted us to be, that we feel growing inside us and the, the feeling of the spirit that's saying, you can, you can be more than this. You can spread my love in the world in, in ways that uh, you hadn't thought of before. So it's something, stories are not just entertainment, they shape, they are part of how we make sense of the world. It's just that, what is a story? I, I loved, um, I think it's Aristotle who said, a story is something that has a beginning, a middle and an end. Duh. <laughs> I, I just love that as a, a definition, <laughs> it was fantastic. But what we always recognise is that it has more than, it has progression it has people having to overcome obstacles it has people having to discover about themselves and about the world and that is sacred that is a, a really sacred thing to do just finally uh, on this little excursus into the world of story if you haven't read Rebecca Solnit's book, The Far Away Nearby, and you're interested in exploring the idea of story, 
run, don't walk, run out to get it. It's just one of the most beautifully told books on um, the exploration of story. And she has this to say uh, at the very beginning, stories are compasses and architecture. We navigate by them. We build our sanctuaries and prisons out of them. And to be without a story is to be lost in the vastness of a world that spreads in all direction like Arctic tundra or sea ice, which means that a place is a story and stories are geography. And empathy is first of all, an act of imagination, a storyteller's art, and then a way of traveling from here to there. The sacredness of stories and the sacredness of the stories that we've immersed ourselves in for the last year can't be, can't be, um, uh, I can't say too, too much about it. It's, it's absolutely there because it reminds us of the sacredness of our own stories. And stories are invitational. They're not a set of doctrine that you must say yes, 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 and, and agree with. They're an invitation to walk into a world and to wonder. And one of the things that I have really appreciated is the art of um, Cody, which does the same thing. Now, feel free to not like it. And feel free to not like the stories and feel free to not like what I've said about the stories because that's what it is. It's engagement. It's not just necessarily saying, love it, love it, love it. It's all about what do I feel when I look at it? What does it remind me of? Does it engage me? Doesn't it engage me? And sometimes engagement is painful or uncomfortable. So even to note that. Uh, one of the things I have really appreciated is the wonderful uh, writing on the art, the reflecting on the art by Joyce Walker. Uh, and I noticed that she uses two of my favourite words right near the beginning of that, gaze and wonder. Gaze and wonder. And I think this is what art does. It invites us to just look and see what's catching my eye and what am I wondering? And I think it works best when you do it with someone else. I think it opens you into conversation. It opens a hospitable space where we can step in and just, what are you seeing? Because other people will see quite different things to, from what we do and they'll feel different things. And so the beauty of Bible study around the narrative is that we're hearing where other people are coming at stories from a very different position from where we are. And it opens us to the wonder of how wide the sacredness of story is. That it's not that I had this story and if you don't have the same or if you don't have the same response to it as I did, you're wrong. There's no sense of that. It's a sense of, well, I wonder about what was happening for you. I wonder what was happening for me. I ended up buying this piece, and this is actually a photo of my work of art, and I entered into a lovely email correspondence with Cody around the buying of it. It's sitting on the floor in my lounge room at the moment because I'm, I'm trying to get my house vaguely ready to move, so I happen to put it up on the wall, but it will go in pride of place when I find a new house. And he's, he does these multi-dimensional things. And every time I walk past it, I stop because something else catches my eye. So it, it mirrors what the stories do, I think. Stop and they catch your eye. You stop and they catch your eye. And it might be an uncomfortable catching of the eye. And we're invited to think about that and to wonder what's going on for us in it. Or it might be a joyous releasing uh, catching of the eye and we're invited to stop and wonder about that too so no right or wrongs in this it's a case of what's expanding within me and within my perception 
that's allowing me to see myself and the world a bit more fully, a bit differently. This is what story does. And biblical narrative is very aware of that. It's told with huge amounts of skill. If you want a lovely introduction to that, I've um, given a bit of a bibliography at the end of the studies. The first one on the list, Robert Alter's book, The Art of Biblical Narrative, shone a spotlight for me that has never gone off. Wonderful book. Um, it, it's scholarly but it's not inaccessible like a lot of scholarly works are and it just gives such a lovely introduction to how the stories work um, that you never read them quite the same okay enough about that I will stop sharing from there and I will come back to what is it that I have learned from the time um where that, that I've been living. One of the things I've learned is, um, I haven't learned, but it's reinforced for me how much I love story. Can you tell? <laughs> it's not like I don't bang on about it often enough, but how liberating and refreshing it is to allow biblical stories to be stories. Not a manual for living, not um, some sense of uh, rules and regulations that we have to try to squeeze our 21st century lives into and wonder why bits keep hanging over the edges and don't quite fit, but just an invitation to enjoy the art of them, to, to find ourselves in there somewhere. And I've found it fascinating as I share these stories with other people, how liberating other people have found them, sometimes with a great sense of nervousness, because these are our sacred stories. And the sacredness of them goes back to the feelings we had as children, Sunday school, our families, our church families, and all of that comes with us. And sometimes when we taught to take these in a very tight sort of um, framework, we can we can feel like we're we're being a little bit disrespectful or even even evil. You know, I've had people who've had that response to come away from that and actually just let the stories be stories, but other people have found it massively liberating and very exciting. So all of those responses. Uh, completely understandable and don't feel don't feel like you're wrong or out of touch um, if you've had any of those you're part of a very wide spectrum all of which is held in the beauty and love of the story itself so what have I what have I come across I think meeting again the playfulness of scripture one of the things that really hit me when I first started uh, studying Hebrew was what a playful language it was. It loves playing with words. It adores a good pun. It loves a double entendre. It, it loves playing with sounds and, and words that can mean two things depending on, you know, just slight differences in pronunciation. It's really playful. And if we miss that, which of course we often do because that doesn't translate, unfortunately, we can take things way too seriously instead of actually letting it be something that's fairly light and invitational, uh, not, not sort of the, the ground of a systematic theology, but an invitation to think about the dynamics of life. So the playfulness, and, and think about it in these stories. In Tamar, that surprise ending, no kidding, every time I read the ending, where Tamar, think about the tension that builds in a story as she is being marched out, the pregnant daughter-in-law, pregnant outside wedlock, being marched out to be burnt at the demand of her father-in-law. And she says to her captors, the owner of these relics is the father and Judah recognises himself and says, she is more righteous than I am. I never can read that without the hair on the back of my neck going up. And I often have trouble getting through it without getting all, 
it's it's an amazing piece of storytelling and it's actually very playful because it treats Judah <laughs> it throws him up in the air it bats him around a little bit it has him come crashing down on his back and Judah is a changed man when we come across him again it, it's playful as well as fiercely dramatic Rahab's wonderful cleverness you know the fact that here is this prostitute where these spies have have gone to almost immediately there's a bit of a playfulness right there what was their purpose in going to the prostitute's place good spymanship or other reasons and as I said Hebrews love a good double entendre they really really do so that's there and then her ability to play them by presenting them with their own history and bring herself and her family into their salvation history and negotiate for the salvation of her family. It's playful. The moment where Ruth lies down and uncovers Boaz's feet and the double entendre of feet in Hebrew anyway. And if we, if we miss that, Boaz rolling over in the middle of the night and, ah, there's a woman at my feet. <laughs> you know? It's meant to be a funny image. And you can just imagine the Hebrew audience laughing their heads off as they, they come across it. The way even the story of Bath, David and Bathsheba so subtly criticises David right at the beginning without saying anything, just it was the time of, uh, it was spring, the time when uh, kings go out to war and David stayed behind in Jerusalem. Really subtle, but the criticism is there. He wasn't meant to be there. He was out of place and then tells the story and lets the story unfold, lets us make up our own mind about what David's doing and whether it's right or wrong. And then in case we missed it right at the end, but what David did was evil in the sight of God. Now, sorry, just, you know, <laughs> can't, can't possibly um, let this one go just in case people are still in love with the image of David and want to sort of let him off the hook. The story does not let him off the hook. And that's, that's playful in itself. Even with Mary, the very fact that it's Mary and, and she is such, maybe out of all, the most unimportant person, you know, historically, uh, socially, just, a, just any old girl. And yet she is the one who is chosen. She is the one who is chosen. And the way Matthew tells the story of this unimportant girl in this unimportant backwater of the great Roman Empire who has probably the least power and influence of anybody on the earth at the time, is chosen to bear the son of God. That actually has an element of playfulness in it because it's that upside down turn that the gospel will continually be doing, ripping the um, carpet out from under our feet if we're starting to get settled and thinking we're important in some way she pulls out the carpet and we're upside down like um, everybody else in the Roman Empire like most of the men in all of the stories it's just an amazing way of um, taking us on a journey that continually surprises us and it invites us to be playful in how we meet with scripture so how might we respond to these stories? It allows us to respond in diverse ways and to revisit them at different stages of our lives. Uh, there's never a solid, you know, and, and, and the moral of this story is it's, it's open. And I find as I look at them, my responses have changed quite a bit over my 25, 28 now years of, of teaching and living with them. I really admire Tamar's astuteness. So I can't begin to imagine using her methods for getting her rights. But on the other hand, I'm a woman of power, uh, of education, of voice. Um, I wouldn't need to use her methods. But the way she uses the resources she has, I just find amazing to keep at what she knew was the right outcome for the continuation of the family. And I wonder 
how committed I am. I wonder whether I'm as committed as she is to doing what's right, to looking at the good of the community, not just my own good. You know, it, it takes me into that space of wonder. I used to read Ruth for Ruth. I was a young woman then, and I had a mother-in-law who was one of my, just a fantastic support to me as I was trying to study for, for my theology degrees and look after small children and work part-time and all the things, you know, all the balls you have juggling. And she committed herself to supporting me. And so Ruth, and I'd look at Naomi and think, wonderful. Now, funnily enough, at 66, I look at Naomi a lot more. And I tend to wonder what it was like to leave home. And I'm about to leave my home of 40 years as a widow, reasonably new widow. I wonder what it was like for her to have no choice about leaving, to leave her family, her support. I have never had to experience that. And I wonder how she managed it. And I wonder about the support of young people, uh, the support of unexpected people. And I look around to see who are those in my life at the moment. I enjoy looking back over my life and seeing with amazement how I've moved into a position of influence, not through anything I've done, but just sheer where work has, has led me. And I think about Bathsheba, who found herself thrust into some sort of position of influence and tried to use it with some grace. And I wonder what my grace is like in using my influence. And then with Mary, I find myself opening up to the possibility of new life always and still being born within me. And I wonder if I can dare to say like she did, let it be with me according to your word. Going to Luke's gospel there, she doesn't get to say that in Matthew's gospel, which is why we have four gospels, which is also playful, let me just say. So then waiting to see what God has in mind for me. I'm also committed to the idea that every person has a story worth telling and worth listening to. And I think hearing these stories has really convinced me of that, where this faithful commitment has taken people into all sorts of places that weren't planned, uh, they weren't heroic, they were just ordinary people doing the right thing for love. Uh, thinking of um, Mother Teresa's comment, there are no great acts, just small acts done with love. And these stories just remind me over and over again of that, where one thing leads to another, but where goodwill and compassion and faithful living towards God leads to all sorts of unimagined outcomes. Um, one of the, I, I just want to quickly share my screen again, because one of the images of this I've been living with um, as long as I've been living with, whoop, I will come back to, yeah, I, I could go on for ages about Cody's paintings, <laughs> I really could. This one I just adore because the, the tortoise actually became for me a little bit of my own totem animal in coming out of the journey of um, you know, widowhood, especially in the time of COVID and, and looking at where my journey might be. But you can, you can read and, and sit with that one yourself. We uh, started going to Zambia to teach in 2009. One of my students was this woman, Joyce Chimbilla, who had just started in this horrible little concrete shack that her family owned, a little feeding program for kids who were... Um, AIDS orphans uh, in the poorest of the poor. They had no schooling. Uh, there was no way they were ever going to go to school because the generational poverty and um, unemployment and uh, lack of education was, was just endemic in this area. And you could see what the place was like. We, we were, it was our Damascus Road experience and, and we knew that we needed to 
commit our lives to walking with Joyce as she discovered that she couldn't get these kids into ordinary schools because they were a bit too old by now. Uh, they were 7 to 12 and uh, the schools wouldn't take them. And even ordinary schools demanded certain expenditure on, on uniforms, on, on equipment that these parents had not, or the, the families, often grandparents with a number of kids are looking after when they're sick themselves, nothing. So we came back home and did what little we could. And that little, and I felt so sorry for Joyce that she got me, <laughs> no skills at all in entrepreneurship, no skills at all in fundraising or hate asking people for money, all this sort of thing. But I told someone and they told someone and they told someone and they told someone and it started to snowball. This year, this is what the school now looks like. When my husband died, a number of the men from the church decided to put together a project to build the, a school in memory of him. And within 11 months, which let me tell you, if had anything to do with Africa in general, Northern Zambia in particular, is a miracle in itself. They got this school up and, up and going. They now have 120 students in primary school, 55 in high school. Uh, they've just taken on, opened up an early learning centre, which has another 90 children. And they're all children who are means tested. If the families can afford to send them to schools, they go to other schools. These are all the poor kids who have everything supplied for them. And these ones up in the top corner here are some of those children you saw in the first photo starting university. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> my heart. So I just wanted to share that. Um, stop share, stop share. As, as just one of many, many stories, and I know that all of you would also have um, stories now. Has that... It's just got in the road there. All of you would have similar stories of ordinary people, ordinary people doing amazing things where they just take a step, then a step, than a step. I think of Tamar, who she's passed around among the men folk in the family to um, fulfill the needs of having children. Um, she fails at that through no fault of her own. She gets sent back to her parents' house. You know, she could have just ended up a disgraced woman with a, a faded, useless life in, in people's eyes. Instead of which, she steps out and she makes something happen. And she ends up, we don't know what her ending is, but we do know that she was taken with some sort of honour into Judah's home where she lived safely and where she was celebrated as the mother of these twins later on. Um, Rahab's story, oh, my gosh, what a life, a hard, hard life, a professional prostitute who had obviously no other means of support, so no man in her family who was able to work and who was able to support her, and so does what she can to look after the whole family. And it could have just been a story of grinding, grinding away at someone's personhood until death, which couldn't come early enough for her. Instead of which we see her story told, looking underneath all of that, to the person of grace and wit and intelligence and um, courage that obviously is there underneath. Ruth's story, two displaced women, and we go back to that, that picture by Cody of the two of them walking, downcast eyes, barefoot, the poorest and most vulnerable in their society, they've lost everything. And they could have just got completely swept away in, in the deep sense of loss. But their mutual support and determination to work for each other's betterment and the future of the family takes them somewhere amazing and allows this incredible story to keep going. Even Bathsheba, you know, not much told us about Bathsheba, caught up in this web of royal story of lust and intrigue and political manoeuvring, but somehow manages to find her own power and voice in the very, very small bits that we're told about her um, in the continuing story. 
And then Mary, Mary, oh my God, we told so little about Mary. One of the responses that someone wrote in said there could have been a bit more depth about, yes, oh my gosh, wouldn't we love some more depth about Mary? We told about three things, you know, there's so little about her in the um, scriptures, so little. It's shocking when you actually go through and trawl and, and pull out everything about Mary. There is so little, you know, almost like Bathsheba, almost nothing. But what there is is so transformational just by this one dead ordinary girl saying, let it be to me as you will. And wondering, I love the stories of Mary pondering in her heart, this deeply contemplative allowing herself to go deeply inside and just listen, see what's happening, and then becoming um, a woman of grace and dignity and one of the grandmothers of the early church uh, where we find her in, in Acts. Something, uh, it's just, just amazing. The tiny bits we know about her, but they're so telling. Um, and they really invite us in our ordinary lives to be the same. So I wonder, you know, I have, I, I have learnt to think, what will I pass on? What am I passing on to my granddaughters in the faith? What are the conversations that I find myself having with young people uh, where I can listen to their story deeply and I can help them see the sacredness of it, but also to listen to my own faith grandmothers and to recognise that they also have something amazing in their lives that might from the outside look dead ordinary that God has been there and the grace has been spread so to be open then to the other to someone else's story and especially those that are unexpected has been I think the deep deep learning and I have to thank you for the comment about my Australian accent <laughs> I hope you can understand me it's the main thing and uh, lovely to see the comment about uh, from the um, Deborah about serving in Zambia. Yeah, wonderful place. And really interesting, Harriet, uh, that there's more about Mary in the Quran than in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. And of course, so much more. And, and this is why I managed to get two studies on her was, was going into the... Um, uh, the legends that grew up around her as the later church got much more interested in Jesus' early life than uh, it had been in the early days. And, of course, Mark, the earliest gospel, not even vaguely interested in Jesus' early life. It starts with, with him um, as an adult. And even John, the latest gospel, the latest of the gospels, um, in a theological coming together of heaven and earth. It's amazing that he doesn't sort of see that coming together within the person of Mary, but he, he dives again over that. So it just shows that uh, the focus wasn't always on the humanness of Jesus, if you like, uh, but on the, that sense of the divinity come among us and dwelling among us. And then sort of slowly people got more and more interested in the humanness, because we need to know, don't we? We need to know that God understands us, uh, that God is with us in, in those kinds of very human ways, I think. And Mary became such a wonderful symbol of that, I think, for the church. So if anybody wants to throw in a comment or ask a question, um, let me invite you to either pop them in the chat or um, raise your hand uh, you know use the raise hand uh, function as Steph showed us right at the beginning. Meryl this is Susan I'm going to upload Joyce's piece on the art to the chat so people can download it there if you want to mention anything about that. Absolutely. Look, as I said, I loved it. And I loved her invitation to, she, she gives you a method for engaging with the art. And we don't always immediately engage with particular types of art. We all have the things, you know, I don't know much about art, but I know what I like is probably something we could all say. And, and she gives us a way to enter into it. And like Hebrew stories, you get more out of it the more you know about what's going on in it. Mm -hmm. And she had some wonderful conversations with Cody uh, Miller, the artist, um, to let him 
say what he was thinking. And he's a young man who has been formed by his grandmothers and has a deep, deep love of, of women of faith and um, really had already been reflecting some of these, some of the paintings he'd already done. Uh, he did a few new ones for this, but he'd already been reflecting on the women's stories. Um, so he was delighted to be part of this and uh, really enjoyed the studies, which I was, I was very happy to hear. So do read um, this, this link of uh, Joyce's work on it, because it will just help you enter into the gazing and wondering at these art pieces if you're finding them a little bit hard to get into. Merle, we had uh, Betty Taylor who had her hand up. It is no longer up, so, but I'm not sure she still has a question. So Betty, let me uh, invite you if you would like to ask a question. No, I think you basically covered it. Thank you so much. Okay. And uh, Linda Hitchens, Linda. Good, well, I good evening. Hi. Um, thank Thank you for doing this webinar for us and it's right on time. Our Presbyterian Women's Group is meeting tomorrow morning and I am leading the group and we're doing lesson six on Bathsheba. Man. I would uh, love to hear what you have to say about Bathsheba. Yeah, Bathsheba. Um, it was probably the hardest um, study to write because there is so little on her. And you really have to write a lot about, you know, I had, I had to write a lot about that story in, in 2 Samuel 11, where she is a cipher, you know, she, she gets to say one word in Hebrew, I'm pregnant is one word in Hebrew. Uh, and she is moved backwards and forwards between her husband's space and the king's space back to her husband's space and, and has no say in it. And it's not until you, you sort of go ahead in the story and glean, you know, you sort of have to pull out um, what else gets said about her. And she only appears twice more, but they're interesting places. And they're at places that are quite pivotal in the ongoing story. So her, her coming to, um, of Nathan coming to her, the prophet comes to her, as clearly a woman of influence as the new king's mother. No, she's not even the new king's mother at this stage. She's uh, one of David's many wives, one assumes one of his favourites. So he's an old man at this stage, so who knows. Um, to look at the succession and who is going to sit on the throne after David is the question. And Nathan comes to her to try to get together a bit of palace intrigue to make sure it'll be Solomon and not um, the oldest son. So Nathan sets something up and then she actually goes to David and she changes it. She, she puts her own words in there and she plays David beautifully. You know, she, she really uses a lot of insight and wisdom to... Um, present the story convincingly. I get that. Um, I had uh, I dinged our car once back when we only had one car. It was my husband's beloved car. You should have heard me tell him that story. It was very different to how I told it to my girlfriends. I led with, you'll be so relieved I'm all right. <laughs> <laughs> Cut the rug right out from under his feet. Uh, <laughs> the car, on the other hand, not so much. Uh, you know, we, 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 we create our world around us um, by, the, by our tellings, by the way we tell our stories. And Bathsheba does that. And then later on, um, when she's trying to negotiate a peace between the, the king and his brothers at a time when classically there would just be an extermination of all other pretenders to the throne and trying to help that pass peacefully. And what I found was some really interesting material on the role of the, the Queen Mother in the ancient Near East. And when you read that and you come and you look at Bathsheba, you see she's doing what she should be doing and she's doing it well. So with very, very, very little <laughs> material to work with, uh, there is something about Bathsheba as a bit of a catalyst. You know, it even, she's even the catalyst for breaking open the things that are going on underneath David, 
where uh, I love Walter Brueggemann has written a beautiful book called David's Truth in Israel's Imagination and Story, something like that, David's Truth, uh, where he says, David has begun to believe his own press notices and starting to think just how wonderful he really is because everyone else thinks he's wonderful. And when he becomes king, that's a very dangerous thing to be, to, to think you're wonderful. And in many ways, the interaction with Bathsheba is what cracks that open. And we see David, the broken man, who has to, in fact, come before God in his deep, deep, deep brokenness and repentance. So again, she's a catalyst, even if she's acted upon rather than acting. Is that helpful? Yes, thank you very much. <laughs> Good. <I appreciate> it. <laughs> Ah, good question. I'm just looking at some of the questions in the um, chat here. Um, um, some huge things. Can I explain Mary and the Catholic Church? Uh, I tell you what's really worth reading, and, and you can find it on the internet. It's a joint statement between the Anglican and Catholic Churches at an international level called Mary, Grace and Hope in Christ. And it's Catholics and Anglicans explaining to themselves and each other why Mary is important. And I found it absolutely enlightening. It was wonderful. Mary, grace and hope in Christ. Really, really worth um, looking up. And it's, it's a public document. So if you Google it, I'm pretty sure you can just find a, um, a public version of it. It's, it's got some pretty hefty theological stuff in it, but they decided together that the best place to start was with scripture um, before, before the churches broke away from each other. Um, but I, I just wonder whether it's part of that retelling um, that I mentioned at the beginning where the church for so long excluded the stories of women. And of course, you know, the Catholic church has kept women out of the priesthood. And one way of bringing themselves back in was to keep telling the story of Mary and placing it front and centre to, to give women um, someone to look to, someone to stand with them. So that's probably the best answer I can give to that at the moment. I mean, it's a great question. And it's a big question. Um, oh, gosh, there. Sherry who, who Harper decided? has a hand up. Oh, oh, you're right. Yes. Okay. Um, Sherry. Hi, Meryl. Thank you. I was just kind of listening to you talk with such passion about all of these different women in the Bible. And it just made me wonder if you were going to write about one of the women who was not in the genealogy in Matthew, who would you want to write about, especially in terms of who might have influenced Jesus? Oh, that's a good one. That's a really, really tricky one. I don't know that I could choose one. There are so many stories that at different times of my life, one of the women I find most intriguing is Michal, Michael, the, the um, wife of David, who is the only woman in the whole of scripture of whom it is said she loved a man. Uh, so she, she actually has this agency and then the very intriguing story of how she's used as a pawn by David um, when she's given away by and her, and her father, who gives her away to another man uh, when David goes on the run and then um, David brings her back to legitimise his, his kingship uh, and align himself with the kingship of Saul before him and how her husband follows after her crying. It's just a little detail. We didn't know to know that. Why did they put that in there? This little sort of heartbreaking detail. So it's little things like that that actually lead me into, I don't know whether it's, it's the inspiration of a particular woman or just the inspiration of how scripture sees these small, what should be unimportant things as important. You know, the response of a simple person. The, the, the small grief or the large grief of someone, the, the confusion of someone at a particular time. I think this is what keeps me passionately engaged with, with all of this and, and just shows me how very, very alive and dynamic it is. So, yeah, I don't think I could settle to one, <laughs> just one. I, I did some work a while ago on the story of Sarah and the story of Naomi and comparing them. 
and just found it fascinating to put together a story of Sarah, because Sarah, we only have bits here and there scattered, but you draw it all together. And there's an extraordinary story of someone who's taken away from her family and she's you know, given away by or allowed to be taken by a king three times, or twice, 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 um, by a king, uh, by Abraham, who's pretending she's not really his wife, and you know, a, a very wronged woman in many ways. So I, I had always been very sniffy about Sarah and the way she treated Hagar, and yet it wasn't terrific. You know, someone who's powerless, who then tries to find power by making someone who's even more powerless suffer for it. And of course, the, the Handmaid's Tale series hasn't exactly endeared us to the Sarahs of, of the world. But when you put her story together, gosh, she, she was a fairly wronged woman herself. Um, so I don't know. I just find all of them really, really intriguing to spend time with. Sorry, you, not, a, not, a, not a neat answer, but... Yeah, no, that's, no, that's very interesting. Thank you. And yeah. You could do a whole a whole study just on trying to redeem Sarah. <laughs> you know, yeah. Interesting. I, I don't know that redeem, but understand her. Yeah, <laughs> understand her at least. And I think I think she is redeemed by the end of it, um, because God, because God, right? Uh, because God takes Hannah and gives her her own story, takes her out of that toxic story, and gives her her own. Yeah. Thank you, Merle. Uh, Lee has her hand up. Lee's uh, iPad. Lee. Yes, Lee. Yeah, sorry. Hi, thank you so much. It is so wonderful to hear you speak and um, tie your story in with these women's stories. Um, my question is, I'm curious, the women who have been chosen, it seems like when I look at Jewish history, the uh, the the Jewishness is passed down through the mothers in, in, in current days. It's very important for a Jewish man to marry a Jewish woman, so his children will be Jewish. But aren't these women mostly outsiders? Oh, Mary's not. But would you comment on the outsiderness of people like uh, maybe Bathsheba and uh, uh, Ruth? Uh, they sort of were... Um, Kind of like the Good Samaritan story, you know, it was like a forerunner idea of, of everybody being included and not just the Jews. And God gives us this, you know, the Jews were chosen, so everyone had to be Jewish. But on the other hand, all of these, many of these women didn't have that heritage. I'd love to hear your comment on that. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Watch me go. Tell me when time's up, everybody. We, we're in for a ride here. Absolutely, and I, I do uh, cover a bit of that in my final um, uh, chapter of the studies, but what I, I'd love to pick up, yes, it was it was in the rabbinic period, which was sort of from about 100 BC onwards, where the rabbinic Judaism, the Judaism that we know now, was forming. Um, and think about the time they, they were no longer a nation. They hadn't been a nation for a good many hundreds of years at this stage. And it was very hard to work out how to not lose themselves as a people. And it starts with um, coming back from the exile to Babylon. So you go back to Ezra and Nehemiah and it's already, well, it's, it's there in a lot of the um, legal codes earlier, but Ezra and Nehemiah, divorce your foreign wives. You, you, you can't bring up Jewish children if they've got foreign mothers who are telling them the stories of other people and gods. So back to storytelling. A lot of the, uh, the mothers needing to be Jewish is because they're the ones who tell the stories. They're the ones who help form uh, identity. And so how do we make sure that identity is formed in struggling communities who are in deep danger of being destroyed and disappearing completely. So if we think about the families that came back from the Babylonian exile that um, Ezra and Nehemiah end up sort of trying to do something to, to help cohere into a, uh, a society that will live and survive, it's um, a messy society. They come back to the ruins of Jerusalem where other people from all sorts of other countries have moved in 
and they are on the brink of extermination. They, they're, they're other, other, there, were, there were many, many people groups around at the time and very, very few of them have survived as a noticeable people group. Um, those who speak Syriac is about the only, the only other group. Um, so the question is of how do we form identity and how do we keep a group identity? Do we do it by pulling up the drawbridge and keeping ethnicity pure? Or do we do it by keeping the story alive and the drawbridge is open and people coming and going to, to keep the bloodlines vibrant and alive? And that was that's always been the struggle. Um, and it still is a struggle in many parts of the world today. Um, the Parsis in, in uh, India uh, having massive problems. They've always had exactly the same idea that you can only marry someone else or we'll lose ourselves. But their numbers are getting so few that they're starting to have to say, or oh, do we bring people in from outside and allow, you know, try to keep the story of who we are and our identity alive that way. So during the time sort of leading up to Jesus, the rabbis decided, okay, the only way you can tell if someone's Jewish, I mean, the only way you can tell <laughs> who the father is might be doubtful. Who the mother is is very obvious. So uh, that's why it's passed down through the mother. There's uh, no doubt who gave birth to the child. Uh, so, so the rabbis made, uh, I can't remember exactly which one it was. Um, there were a lot of them who were making rules and regulations at the time. And it was about keeping in a very hostile world they've been taken over by the greeks they've been taken over by the romans um they've been forced to assimilate into greek culture uh, they'd attempted to fight back the essenes uh, the maccabees to gain their own culture back again but there was always this tension and uh, to survive in a very hostile world do you become like the majority or do you separate yourself out so the interesting thing is that through all of that, there was always this strong voice that said we must separate, but there was always an undercurrent of voice, which these women's stories belong to, which always said, but look about, look at the importance of strangers. You know, there, it was foreigners who helped the story keep going. Yeah. And that goes into the New Testament. Yeah. So the early church is trying to... Um, the, the big, big tensions in the early church is between the Jewish Christians who feel that you, you have to be Jewish to, to be a Christian and those who are converting Gentiles. And that's when the church gets kicked out of the synagogue. Up until mm. then, they, they existed quite happily within the synagogue. But once they started talking to Gentiles, out they went. And, you know, I think I might have mentioned, I can't remember now, um, in my final wrap up um, study, you know, that that wonderful um, moment where it all comes together for Peter with the, uh, the vision of the, the lowering of the sheet with all the unclean animals in it. And that's when Peter is confronted with this absolute very question that these women have been confronting the Israelite people with you know, their stories have been confronting the Israelite people. So for Matthew to choose these women is, once again, it's a little bit like the teller of the story of 2 Samuel 11. It was the time of war, when, uh, time, time of year when kings go out to war, David stayed in Jerusalem. He doesn't start off by saying, you've got to convert the Gentiles. It's all right to convert Gentiles. He just allows these women's names to tell the story for him. Because when people read that, they knew the names, but they knew the stories behind those women. These were their scriptures. They heard them read over and over and over. So subtle, subtle, subtle um, way of just popping the little wedge in to say, this was part, always part of our story. This is not new. This is not a shocking thing. This has always been who we are. Yeah. Wow. Thank you. That's awesome. So ho hopefully that wasn't, um, oh, someone's put there, the story and identity problem at, is at the heart of division in the United States today and everywhere else, my dear, whoever wrote that. But yes, I, I definitely hear 
<laughs> what, you, what you're saying. Absolutely. And it's all about identity formation. Um, do we form ourselves over against the other? Or do we form ourselves by having a strong sense of who I am? Therefore, I can go out confidently into the world with curiosity about the other. Merle, we have one more raised hand from Gretchen Denton. Hi, Gretchen. Hi there. Uh, I was uh, wondering if uh, I, I have, we haven't done uh, Bathsheba yet, so I can ask a stupid question. Uh, is there is there much conversation? What do you write about? Basically, uh, Bathsheba is raped by David, uh, and uh, you know, it seems like this is sort of a recurring story that is not unrelated to our world today when people, particularly men of power, can do what they want. Yes. And they want it. absolutely. And really, that, that whole story is about David's abuse of power. The whole story is about that. And it's made very, very clear. I love um, Nathan's use of story. In, in confronting David, he doesn't come in and say, you're a horrible, horrible man. He comes in and tells him a story. And he tells him a story that would have related to David, who was a shepherd once, about a poor man who had one little lamb and the rich man who had flocks and flocks and flocks, but who uses his power to take the poor man's lamb and kill it. And David is horrified. And, of course, all Nathan has to say then is, you're the man. And what comes after that, the, the, the language in uh, David's condemnation, uh, Nathan's condemnation of David is, I gave, this is God speaking, I gave you, I gave you, I gave you, I gave you. You took, you took, you took, you took. So when David is being given, there is grace when David takes, he has gone completely off the path. And it is about the abuse of power. Absolutely. So, so Bathsheba in that story, and there have been all sorts of crazy sermons over the years about her flaunting herself. It doesn't <laughs> even say she's on the roof. It says David's on the roof. You know? yeah. um, and, and all the men have gone off to war. She should have, she should have expected to be completely safe to have bathed in the, in the local marketplace if she wanted to. You know? <laughs> He's not, he is the one out of place. And when you go back to um, the legal system in Leviticus, the holiness code, out of place is wrong. You know, that, that's right there. If you're not in the right place, you're, uh, you're unclean. You're, you're in the, you know, so the whole telling of that story is making it very clear that David is the one who is wrong. It's not about Bathsheba, it's about David. Yeah. Thank you. And then, of course, what he does to Uriah, oh, my goodness. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Meryl, uh, Leah, did you, you had your hand up for a while. Would you like to ask your question as we near the end? Oh, gosh, I would love to. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I'll be honest, I, I've not done this study, but I've been very interested in doing it. And as I've been listening to you speak uh, throughout this event tonight, I can't help but, you know, I, I would love to hear your thought on God as one of the grandmothers. You know, God is this maternal presence that we don't always hear so much about, but there, there are, you know, parts in scripture that mention him having these mothering wings over, you know, people and, and suffering and whatever. So I would just be curious, like, about your thoughts on, on God as maternal. Sure. And of course, God is many things in the, in the, uh, in the narrative, because sometimes God is required by the script to be things that we find really very difficult. And of course, uh, there is this sense of God um, being told to fit in with how gods were imagined in the ancient Near East. But what I find fascinating is the number of times God breaks through those uh, to, as you say, be shown as a mothering God. I love um, how God is in the background of a lot of the stories. And it's one of the intriguing things, and Robert Alter actually talks about this, I'm not sure whether it's in the book that I, I suggested or somewhere else, where he is looking at 
why did certain things make it into the canon of the Bible and other things didn't? You know, there are lots and lots of other stories, many of which are in the Apocrypha. And he thinks it's about balance between God and human, that there's always this really dynamic kind of balance between the actions of, of God and people that made it into scripture, that it's never God just sort of thundering down from above and going, or, or you know, um, sort of like, I don't know, some, some of the stories in the Apocrypha have angels coming and doing it all while people just kind of stand there and get saved. Um, and, you know, you get little bits and pieces, but on the whole, these stories are about humans' actions, but God being underneath them. So the fact that in Ruth, it's just that word hesed, steadfast love, loyal love, that brings in God's presence, because everyone knows that it's one of the most consistently named characteristics of God. So you can't hear that word hesed without hearing wings flap or you know the wind in your hair of the spirit or whatever it is that you imagine as God's presence uh, among you and people living uh, I think I used the the term before towards God towards that that integration um, there is no accident that the first chapter of the Bible is this beautiful look at creation in which all things are interrelated that ends up with um, these are the generations of the heavens and the earth when God created them. It's all family. And then, of course, everything gets broken up because, you know, that's what happens. But whatever moves family back towards integration and moves people back towards integration with God and moves um, nations that have been fighting each other or despised each other like the Moabites, the Israelites hated the Moabites, there's Ruth, the Moabite, you know, integration, integration. There is the presence of God. And, and that's, the, that's the, the golden thread that runs through like God's care for the poor, God's care for the outcast, God's care for the forgotten, the voiceless, just keeps coming through and, and provides this thread that goes right through that is beyond historical um, context. Does that... Did that get anywhere near answering your question? I, I kind of lost myself there for a bit. I think so. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Good stuff. Thank you very much. There's so many comments and, uh, oh, someone said, if I had written Matthew's genealogy, which women would I have included and why? I'm happy with the ones that are there. <laughs> I'm really, really happy with the ones that are there. I think, uh, you know, there, there was a lot of thought went into which women to pop, put in. And uh, when you read the rest of Matthew's gospel, he had very good reason for putting those women in. Meryl, may I ask a question? You may be. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of my favorite parts of the study, and I hope I just haven't um, taken my own license with the story, but feel free to. And when near the end, when you're talking about Jesus learning from his grandmothers and then teaching the disciples what he learned and that then we take, then we learn from the disciples and we take that with us. I, could you talk about that just a little bit? I, I love that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Look, so some of it comes from that um, fascinating story of, of um, Jesus crossing over. And I think one of the important things to hear here is Jesus crossing over. Jesus was forever taking the disciples somewhere where they wouldn't normally go um, and actually making them go into uncomfortable places and spaces. But the, the story of the Syrophoenician woman or the Canaanite woman, depending on which gospel you're reading, where they're in a place which is hostile to Jews. It's not a place where they would normally go. They would think of it as unclean. And uh, that wonderful interaction with the woman where he says, Jesus says to her that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm the bread's for the children, not for the dogs under the table. And she comes back quick as a wit and you can hear Rahab behind her saying, yes, but even the dogs get to eat the scraps. And I have so many different interpretations run around in my mind of that, whether she's, you know, the, the grandmother's reaching forward and giving him a clip over the ear or whether he's doing it deliberately to teach his disciples even more fully by watching him make an absolute, you know, 
as of himself, um, you know, just what's going on there. But certainly for Matthew telling that story, there are echoes of the grandmothers and the disciples are being con confronted with their own prejudices, with their own exclusion zones. And yes, the bread is for everyone. Even the, the uh, feeding of the 5,000 stories, the basket falls left over. Why do they bother telling us about the leftovers? It's not just to say there was lots of food. It's to say there are enough, there's enough leftovers for everyone. And it ties back into that story, even the scraps. There's enough for everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, so someone else had asked me uh, if there were unmarried women in Jesus' genealogy. Well, Mary. <laughs> Mary. Is, is, is that an amazing thing to think about? Uh, we don't know what's, oh, well, he quietly married her eventually, but she was not married when she was pregnant. Mm -hmm. uh, and we cannot underestimate the disgrace. We cannot underestimate. Um, you know, there are still honour killings in the Middle East. There are still honour killings. You know, this is not a problem of 2,000 years ago. This is something that is still current, that a woman's whole role was to be sexually pure and to be therefore able to make um, a joining together of two families for the benefit of her own family through, and, and what she had to give was her virginity. That was her that was her entire function and so she was seen as disgracing the entire family so it wasn't just her disgrace she would have been cast out of her family and her family would have been cast out of the community you know unbelievable disgrace that's why joseph was going to do the quiet the kind thing mm -hmm. by putting her away quietly so her family wouldn't be disgraced and so for him to go over and beyond and to actually believe this weird angel who comes to him and says it's all right is a humongous step for this good Jewish man who's always done the right thing. He's about to have to do incredibly the wrong thing as an act of faith. So, you know, it, we, we, we've, we're so used to hearing the story that it doesn't actually have all that much impact on us anymore. And we have to kind of wrap our minds into going back into that time and place. So just to remember that all of these women were putting themselves or had been put, had already been put in human, a large amount of danger um, and were dealing with incredible courage to make sure that that living towards God, that integration, that moving forward, that salvation story would keep going. And so we, we listen to our own stories and we realise that ours are also sacred stories. Every single one of you, every single one of us, our story is also sacred. And it, it walks, we walk on holy ground every step that we take. I think I need to close up now and I'm happy to hang around and um, talk a little bit longer if people want to hang around. So I'm not going to sort of hit close the second we finish. And uh, if someone has taken a bit of a copy of the chat and there are any questions there that um, you think I could I could do a bit more of answering, um, do feel free to email them to me, Betsy or Steph or whoever. And um, I'm very happy to have a go at that. And if any of you... Uh, burning with questions from your um, study groups, email me. Happy to answer questions. Always happy to do that. But if I could just close with a benediction for you all from um, this, this time of sharing together. Our creative, nourishing God, we thank you that you come to us so often through our relationships with other people, friends, families, or the stories of those who've gone ahead of us. And even through those who we least expect. Help us to recognise the sacredness of the ground that we walk. The sacredness of the lives of those who've gone before, who teach us about faithfulness and courage. The sacredness of our own lives that invites us to forgive ourselves and our circumstances 
and to be alert for your new life, putting up green shoots within us and around us. And the sacredness of your life always being born anew within each of us, to be nurtured in hope and compassion, and then to spill out into everything around us. May we go on in our ordinary lives with a sense of your wonder and invitation always drawing us on with Tamar's ingenuity, Rahab's courage, Ruth's compassion, Bathsheba's determination, and Mary's openness to saying yes to the call of your spirit. In the name of Jesus, the one who journeys ahead of us and with us. Amen. Seeing Pick Smaller's iPad and with a question, maybe, and Lee seems oh. to have another question. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I'm, I'm just scrolling down rapidly, but I haven't May quite I, got to it. <laughs> May I so ask, ask, a, ask the question? Good. Yep. May I ask a very silly question? No what silly time? question. Oh, yes, it is. What time <laughs> is it there? <laughs> oh, no, that's not a silly question. Yes, she is. Where's my clock? It is just after one o'clock Wednesday afternoon. Oh, wow. Oh, goodness. <laughs> wow. So, so we're about, what, 15, 15 hours ahead of you? Six, uh, mm. 14, 15 hours ahead of you, I think? Yes. Mm. Yeah. So I know. It might be I 17. A, yes, already. Wow. I have a question. Yes. Yeah. I was, I was wondering if you can comment on when uh, the idea of multiple wives for each of these men in uh, Jewish history, uh, when did that idea go by the wayside and we, how did we get to this one wife, one husband system that uh, doesn't allow divorce or separation, you know, it, it, in the Christian realm? Oh, um, such an interesting how did we get where we are? Um, look, goodness only knows. I mean, it was always an economic thing um, because women needed looking after but also they needed to have as many children as they possibly could to because oh, you know yes. half the kids more, more than half the kids would have died in infancy and you need as many children as you can to work the land oh, so oh, yeah. it's pretty common in um, agricultural based communities you know the sort of subsistence cultures as we call them where people are scratching from morning to night to get enough to mm -hmm. stay alive is to basically have as many as many uh, fertile women having children as possible so um, that's, a, that's sort of a common economic um, issue around the globe. When it stopped, goodness only, that's a really interesting question. By the time of David, it probably would have been only the rich or the, someone in his position um, who could afford it. It's also becoming gradually becoming a more um, city-based gradually from, from that time on. And... For, for David and, and Solomon, you know, we know lots about Solomon. So, oh, well, everyone um, sort of knows the story of Solomon's 700 concubines. They were all political alliances. Okay. So, so for, for a king, uh, how do you make an alliance with another country? It's um, bringing yet another wife. Um, so mm. the comment about Solomon's 700 concubines, for example, is not saying what a highly sexed man Solomon is. It's saying what an important politically man Solomon was in this tiny country surrounded by much bigger countries, how important Israel had become by that time. So it's actually a political statement. So, and Solomon actually was able to impregnate all 700 women. <laughs> oh, who knows? They, 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 don't, they don't tell us. Who knows? Um, <laughs> I'm curious. <laughs> oh, I, I, I imagine no. In fact, probably never even met half of them because that would have yeah. been a nightmare for the succession. You don't want lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of claimants to the throne. You know, I mean, it would be an absolute nightmare. I but see. When, it's, it's really interesting. And I, I simply don't know is all I can say because um, yeah. certainly, you know, the stories of the patriarchs like um, Abraham, uh, Jacob, uh, Isaac, it's taken completely for granted that they'll have many wives. Um, the kings, mm. it's taken for granted. Um, so at what stage it becomes one for one? really don't know.
That's really interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Thank you so much. We, we get Thank that you comment. so much. I, I have to go away. It's 9 p.m. Okay. and I have to leave, but I'm so okay. glad to have been here. Thank you. Yeah, well, thank you for your question. It's really I love your story. I love your Bible study. Thank you. Thank you. Is Sue Mummert still here? Sue had a question, but then I think her battery was fading. Oh, right. <laughs> they have lost her. Meryl, there's so many lovely comments in the chat about this. I was story. just reading them. It's just beautiful. Thank you to everybody. Uh, yes, do feel free to hand out my email address. I'm quite happy with that. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> just seeing the fastest, fastest 90 minutes I've ever spent. Actually, it was for me, too. We did no time. <laughs> Meryl, I think Gretchen has another question. Yep, go for it. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm just interested that, you know, we don't really know about these women that much. I mean, uh, you mentioned that the early hearers of Matthew's gospel would have said, oh, I, I know who that, I hear that woman, I see that woman, but really we don't in our, in the preaching and in the lectionaries. Yep. I mean, when have we had a story about Tamar? I mean, so it's just a curious, thing i did see the other day that somebody is doing a whole new lectionary based on stories related to women uh, that's are we, are we moving more towards stories about women or what are you seeing uh, i i like to hope we are i mean apart from anything else there's been such a massive burgeoning of ordained women uh, so the people who are doing the preaching are not entirely male um, and that will make a difference as we reclaim and tell the stories that um, made us and that we can help make other people, including the men, you know, they need to hear these stories too. Um, and, and, you know, the question is, of course, who set the lectionary? It was certainly there would have been no women on that committee, I can assure you. So the question of at what stage do we revisit things in light of um, our understandings of what's important. I think what I found fascinating with these women, um, particularly apart from Bathsheba, but even Bathsheba gets her say, is how much time is spent on them. That Tamar has a whole chapter, but she's a bit player if you think about it, but there's this whole chapter on her smack in the middle of the Joseph, Joseph narrative. It interrupts the main um, action and a whole chapter uh, that for, for um, Rahab, the beginning of the entry into the, into the land of these people who've been wandering in the wilderness forever, and they tell the story of this prostitute that goes for nearly two chapters and then revisit uh, a little while later to say what happened to her. It's amazing. You know, why do they spend so much time on them, so much loving attention to detail? Ruth, an entire novel on Ruth and Naomi, uh, you know, they weren't always seen as unimportant or sidelined. Uh, so it, it's, a, it's a decision that gets made by someone at some stage to not include those stories. And so you have to think what's going on underneath that and what do we need to do to reverse it? So I'm delighted to hear this talk of a new lectionary. This has been so interesting and uh, I really appreciated it. And I love I love doing the study and I think our the and the women in our study, you know, we we decided we would read the whole we'd read from the Bible Tamar and there's just so much in there that is obvious and yet it's hidden until you look at it carefully. So thank you for doing that to helping oh, us see yeah. these women. Lovely. And I just see that someone, uh, Lucy, has put in there extra canonical women. Oh, yes. Judith. Susanna. <laughs> Some fabulous stories of women. Judith is, is one of the, and I think, I think Judith should be in the Bible. And I reckon why she isn't is because it's um, 
shows up the elders in a very bad light. <laughs> That's my theory, and I'm sticking to it. I have no idea, but <laughs> they're well worth it. It's really worth getting an apocrypha if you don't have one. The newer RSV has put one out. Um, very, very good. Mm. And ripping yarns, they're fantastic. But the stories of these strong women who've um, managed to find some deep integrity inside themselves when when the men around them are crumbling beautiful yeah i when i was excuse me when i was starting to prepare for the leading our bible study and is it tamar or tamar I, oh, you say it however you like okay i say uh, tamar but that's me i'm australian <laughs> oh well i say tamar and that's me a virginian I, I, I discovered that there were two women by the same name. Yes, yes. Because when I started looking it up, it didn't seem like it fit. And then yeah. I looked more deeply and uh, did a little broader and, and discovered more about it. And that has come up in our discussions in the women's Bible study more than once, that there were actually two. So yeah. different times, of course. Yes, uh, Tamar, the daughter of David, who is raped by her brother, and uh, David knows nothing about it, and that's why um, Absalom um, kills his brother, who uh, Amnon, who did the raping later on, and um, why why Absalom takes against David because he did nothing to uh, redress what happened to uh, Absalom's sister Tamar. So it's part of part of the outplay of um, Nathan's curse against David after the Bathsheba incidents. At least you know, what, there'll be strife in your family, basically. Do we have a Nathan now? A Where prophetic prophetic voice? Are you yes. Okay? I think there are a lot of them, and often they're in the arts. Ah, yeah. Never thought of that. I, I think, you know, the voices that oh, hold oh. mirrors up to our, us and our society and say, look at what you've become. I remember years ago, Aaron Darty Roy writing an amazing article in which she was saying, um, I can't remember what particular Gaza incursion it was about, but she was saying to Israel, you think you still think you're David, but you've become Goliath. Whoa. I mean, that's a holding a that that's a Nathan, you lamb moment. Right. Uh, to say you yeah, you've you've experienced what it's like to be small and helpless, and here you are, um, picking on the small and helpless in your society. Um, and there are there are many other voices. They get closed down. Uh, they get called fake news. They get called all sorts of things. But I think journalists and artists and musicians and movie makers and novelists and there there are so many people who are able to read our story and retell it in a way that we have to read it we have to see it and make us think again about oh you know just confront us with ourselves and our society mm -hmm. with ourselves. yeah yeah mm -hmm. It's, it's a good, it's something that I used to get my students to do when we were studying the prophets. Keep an eye out for the modern prophets. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. May I ask this question? You may. Mark, yes. I'm wondering, how does Tamar get in when she is a deceiver? How does David get in the Bible when he has committed adultery, he has killed? I mean, to me, it's hard. I yep. have a hard time accepting yep. them. Absolutely. And um, one of the, I mean, there are two different questions there. The Tamar one, there was um, in many, in many societies and, and certainly in the ancient Near East, there's a kind of person in a story called a trickster. Mm -hmm. And the trickster is someone who uses their wit to outwit someone stronger and more important. So it's the story of the little person who's being put upon by someone in more power who manages to trick them and therefore get the better of them. So for us, we might think it's, a, it's someone who's telling lies. For them, right. they're celebrating that it's someone without, without power who is actually overcoming the person with power who is oppressing them. So, so it's a cultural difference in how we understand truth 
but it's a deceiving way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and they have no problems at all with that. Um, you you and the Bible itself have problems. Uh, it's really interesting if you read um, 1 Kings 22, 2 Kings, uh, no, 2 Kings 22, the story of Micaiah ben Imla, where a couple of the, who's a prophet, and a couple of kings come to him uh, and say, should we, or they, they call on all the prophets, first of all, a great crowd of prophets to say, should we go up to this war? And the prophets all say, yes, 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 you'll win, you'll win, you'll win. And one of the kings says, nah, no, that was a bit easy. Have you got anyone else? And uh, King Ahab says, oh, there's this prophet Micaiah, but I don't like him. He always says something nasty about me. <laughs> and, and the other king says, bring him, bring him, bring him. And Micaiah says, yes, 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 you'll win. And the king says, don't give me that. I know that's not what you really think. And you have this wonderful scene where Micaiah says, I was brought into the, the, um, uh, the heavenly council and a lying spirit came and said, how will I deceive the king? For, because, you know, into his own downfall. I'll be a lying spirit in the mouth of the prophet. Now, we read that and we go, what? <laughs> but for the culture... It made complete sense because it was, again, this trickster sort of thing of how do you get to unsettle someone who has all the power when you have no power? Tricksters. And, and, and tricksters, yeah. And is that is that accepted by God to be a trickster? Um, well, the, <laughs> the Bible's not even vaguely bothered by it. I think what the Bible, and, and this comes back to the David thing, yeah. is what the Bible is interested in is repentance. So David, I think, gets in there. And, and if you read something like Psalm 51, which has that long story up on top of it, the rabbis put there later that ties it to the, the whole Bathsheba incident. And it's that deep, deep, deep Psalm of penitence. What David was celebrated for finally was that he could hear and repent. So I think um, for me, one of the, the most wonderful things about reading all this stuff is that they're broken people like me. And if I think, oh, God, I've done something God will never accept. I remember David and think, now nah, I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> Most of us God, would be God fine. Could, if God can handle David, David he can handle me. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we won't pass the test if we repent. Yes, and, and truly repent and the recognition of, you know, who am I in the presence of God? And right. coming back to that question, who am I in the presence of God? And um, new starts, you know, the Bible is just one great mass of new starts. I know. It's hard, hard to accept sort of that they should be in the holy book. Yeah, but that's... Did we, Tamar, we, we call, I'm we, sorry? Did what, Tamar, does ho what does holy mean? What does holy mean? I guess it's a question. It's not about uh, deep purity. It's about becoming. I think it's did, about becoming. Did Tamar repent? What does she need to repent from? Deceiving father-in-law, Papa. No, 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 no. They didn't see that as something. They they saw that as something to be absolutely celebrated. <laughs> absolutely celebrated. No deception required. No, no repentance required. <laughs> that, that's a cultural difference. And uh, it's a story of the powerless against the powerful. You know. It's the story what, of what? The, the powerless power. against oh, the, powerless the powerful versus the powerful. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So the powerless can do what they want as long as they say sorry. Or no, 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 no. She doesn't need to say sorry, and it's not doing what she wants. It's doing what leads to the right outcome. Yeah. Okay. All right. Oh, there's another another. Janet's got a hand up there. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um. I was going to say, isn't it also partly that we tend to focus on the character story, like she, uh, but Tamar and and David and stuff, whereas the Bible is really God's story of how He interacts with His people. So, um, and I think it, it it's to prove that we aren't worthy of the grace of God that that there is no rhyme or reason for him to forgive us I mean if, if you know what I'm saying it, it's it, 
we have to see ourselves as God sees us or the way he created us to be. And I think sometimes we get so wrapped up of seeing either ourselves or somebody else at with their flaws. And I, God doesn't see our flaws. He sees our potential, what he wants. And we can only achieve that if we allow him to, to do so. But mm -hmm. it's, it's just, it's kind of a strange thing because we don't deserve it. And I know women that to this day, I have a, actually my sister-in-law will say, I will not go to a church with a woman pastor because it's not biblical. Mm. I, it's just, it's amazing. Yep. 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 Uh, that's a, that's a really good point. And uh, there was something that came to me while you were saying that and it's just left, but it was incredibly profound. You would have all loved it. <laughs> And I can't for the life of me remember what it was, but it's a really good point. Oh, I know what it was. It was, and it's not that profound. It was simply that um, Hebrew storytelling is very sparse. It doesn't give us a lot of details. It doesn't give us motivation. It's not like Greek. Our, our, our storytelling tends to come from the Greek where you, you sort of led deeply into the psychology of the person and everything else. There are a lot of little bits and pieces that, in fact, we're not meant to dwell all that much on. We're not meant to sort of spend a lot of time worrying about was this right, was that wrong, because they pass over it very quickly to get to where they're going with it. Yeah, and I think you're really right. The end. Where they're always going with it is the grace of God and, and the right fact that God is absolutely committed to um, continuing the family story, continuing the story of God and people. And, and always moving towards uh, salvation, integration. So whatever whatever gets us there is what they're more interested in than the methods used to get there. So it's just it is it is tricky because this is you know um, these these are the writings of two two and a half thousand years ago, and it was a different world and they thought differently, but people were the same. You know, people still had their longings and hopes and dreams and failings and wonderful moments and compassion and helping out and love but um, the way society worked was of course very very different from what we're used to so we, we just sometimes have to put little brackets around things that drive us nuts because they're not what we not what we find comfortable <laughs> Well, I know that we could go on forever and yeah, ever. I was just going to say, I think I need to go now because I'm hungry. You've been so <laughs> generous with your time, Meryl, and, and, and everything else too. Uh, so um, Steph has explained all the additional ways that we'll have the material available from the website to sending out questions with answers that weren't, um, weren't asked here. And um, we'll just keep talking about uh, this great story that we are allowed to be a part of. And thank you, Meryl. <laughs> My pleasure. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity. It's just been wonderful, wonderful working with the team and wonderful with all of you fantastic women. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me into your lives in this small way and blessings on all of your future grapplings with this amazing text that just keeps us Keeps one, us growing one, and alive. One, one question before I leave. <laughs> were there moral standards? Sorry? They, were there moral standards that they had to live by? Was there something? <clears throat> um, they were to do with uh, social interactions, like uh, looking after right. the poor. Um, so there was the Code of Hammurabi. I, I could go on like, about this for a while too, which I won't. <laughs> there was a legal code written a long time before the times we're thinking out by um, a, a king of Suma, so very ancient, called about 4000 BCE, uh, called the Code of Hammurabi. Oh, and that became that. the basis of just about all legal codes. Mm -hmm. And the legal code set out the standards of caring for the widow, the orphan, uh, the poor among you. So they're the sort of main, main things. And apart from that, the Ten Commandments. And the mm -hmm. Ten Commandments were about... Um, you know, not robbing and cheating and um, stealing things that aren't yours and all that sort of thing. So they sort of draw the outer the outer line, but you fill in the middle in all sorts of ways. So they, they, they're they very sparse, aren't they, the Ten Commandments? Right, right. But, but they sort of, you know, if you murder someone, it's very hard to have a good relationship with them. <laughs> <laughs> 
All right, I had better go, but thank uh, you. You must be exhausted. Thank you so much. Okay, bye now.